All right, let us continue in prayer. Dear gracious God, we give thanks for the opportunity to worship this morning. Uh, we give thanks for your presence with us, your Holy Spirit among us. And we pray, Lord, that, that as we open up your scriptures, you'll open up our hearts and our minds, and that as we, as we hear your word, you will once again cleanse us and um, have your mercy and grace be showered upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. I actually wanted to read two scripture passages this morning. We're going to start with the book of Acts, chapter 2, um, just verses 1 through 4. Acts 2, 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. And then turning to the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Amen. Well, there's a story about a boy who was wandering around in the church narthex of a large downtown church on a Sunday morning, and, and on the wall there was a big bronze plaque with a list of names on it. Well, the pastor was walking by, and, and the, boy, the boy asked, what are the names on that plaque? And the pastor said, son, so those are the names of people who died in the service. And after a long pause, the boy looked up and asked, was it the 845 or 11 o'clock service? Well, I'm, I'm happy to report to you today that we are celebrating a birth this morning, not a death. We are celebrating the birth of the church. Not only the birth of the church, but, but the birth of Christ, the Holy Spirit in you and in me. Today, as we said, is Pentecost, the church's birthday. And you know, something spectacular, something life-changing, something world-shaking happened on that first day of Pentecost. It was not something chaotic or faddish. It, wasn't, it, it was not a new philosophy or, or kingdom that would, would last for a day or a week or even a year or even a century. It, it was a new determination that was going to last forever. It was this new thing that was going to be around forever. You see, the Holy Spirit on the first Pentecost is still lasting today, and it is so powerful, it's so determined, it's so magnificent that, that it, can, it can be just as potent for us here today as it was for the disciples 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem. Ever since that first Pentecost Sunday, I think we, the church, we've tried to, to replicate their enthusiasm and excitement, to replicate their passion and zeal. That's exactly what one particular congregation did as, as the people filed into the, the sanctuary on Pentecost Sunday. The ushers handed them a bulletin and a red carnation. A red carnation to symbolize the festiveness of the day. The people listened attentively to the reading of the Pentecost story from the book of Acts about how the disciples heard what sounded like a powerful wind from heaven and about how the Holy Spirit appeared like tongues of fire. And then came the sermon... And the preacher began, he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon us. And then the congregation replied like a powerful wind from heaven, and they started throwing their red carnations onto the chancel. And the preacher began again, he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon us. And the people shouted like, like tongues of fire, like tongues of fire. And, and they threw more than their red carnations. Some of them threw their scarves and their hats and, and their coats. And this went on. For a little while, the preacher would say, the Spirit of the Lord is upon us. And they would say, like, tongues of fire, like, like the wind. And they would throw things onto the chancel. So then the preacher said, 
Now throw your money. Throw your wallet. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us. To which one woman in the front pew replied, Preacher, you just done calmed the wind and put out the fire. (laughs) Okay, don't worry. I only have two Pentecost jokes, and I just used them, so there's no more, no more for today. But as you may or may not know, there are actually two accounts of Pentecost in the New Testament. One is the one we usually focus on. It's the loud and large celebration. And the other is, is more of a small and, and quiet observation. I wanted us to just look briefly at both of those this morning. Luke is the host of the Pentecost celebration where we are most used to. It's loud and exciting with many people. John is the host of the more small, quiet, obscure celebration. So let's start with Luke. Luke is the author of the book of Acts. So so in Acts chapter 2, it tells us there were about 120 people in the house and thousands of people on the streets of Jerusalem. They were there for the festival of Pentecost. The festival of Pentecost was a Jewish holiday that fell 50 days after the Passover. And Luke describes it as a, a violent wind. He says there's fire. He says there's tongues and they're speaking in other languages. Peter telling the people that God is giving us the Holy Spirit. 3,000 people gave their life to Christ. There were baptisms. There was a celebration. It was marvelous. It was one of those mountaintop experiences. Actually, in Eugene Peterson's version of the Bible called The Message, he he puts it this way, starting with verse 1 of Acts 2. He says, When the Feast of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and without warning there was a sound like a strong wind, gale force winds. No one could tell where it came from. It filled the whole building, and then like wildfire, the Holy Spirit spread through their ranks, and they started speaking in a number of different languages as the Spirit prompted them. You know, actually, it's interesting to note that Luke's account of the birth of the church, what, what is in Acts 2, is, is based on Exodus 20 in the Old Testament. See, for the Old Testament Jews, Pentecost was the celebration of the giving of the law. And Luke des- describes the giving of the Holy Spirit in the same way. You remember Exodus 20? The people are at the, at the foot of Mount Sinai, and they're afraid. It's a stormy and windy and cloudy day, and the people are scared. So the people say to Moses, you go up. You go up there and find out. Go up on the mountain, and you find out what God wants, and come back and tell us. So Moses goes up the mountain, and it says in in Exodus 20 that there was violent wind, and there was fire, and then Moses comes down from the mountain with the stone tablets, the Ten Commandments. It's interesting It's interesting that when Luke describes the Holy Spirit coming upon the church, he he draws from Exodus Exodus 20 and that powerful moment in the history of Israel. The other Pentecost story recorded in Scripture, it's a little more quiet. It's a little more subdued. It's from John 20. This is after Jesus had risen from the dead. They're in a house. The disciples are in a house in Jerusalem. We're not sure how many disciples are there, but we do know the door is locked. They are scared. And suddenly, Christ appears to them. And, and, and he says, peace be with you. And he shows them his hands, and he shows them his pierced side. And they recognize him. And they say, it is the Lord. And Jesus says again, peace be with you. And then he says, as the Father sent me, now I send you. What I've done in my life is now up to you to continue. Keep it going, Jesus said. And then get this. In in, in this version of the Pentecost story, there's not wind or fire. Jesus just breathes on them. Just human breath in human word, receive the Holy Spirit. See, this too is Pentecost. This too is a way the Holy Spirit descends upon us. Instead of using violent wind and frightening moments at Mount Sinai, John describes it, 
John describes Pentecost actually in light of Genesis 2. John also goes back to the Old Testament, to the history of Israel. But, but he goes back, all the way back to Genesis. You know, Genesis 2 says, God breathed into their nostrils and they became living souls. Living souls. Think about that. Fred Craddock, a homiletics professor, puts it like this. He says, in the beginning, God made everything else. The squirrels, the snails, the elephants, the giraffes, the duck-billed platypus, everything. Everything that's in our gardens and in our yards and in our forests. God already made all of those. Then, God, out of clay, made a person. And Craddock goes on to imagine. He says, what if, what if, let's just scare ourselves for a moment, what if God had not imparted God's own spirit into this being? The human would be like an animal. Humans living like animals because they had not received the spirit of God. Just think about it. God took this creation made out of clay and breathed, and it became a living soul like God. God said, I have breathed into this one my own life. Fred Craddock goes on to argue that this is probably why humans are not content with, with just eating and drinking and working, you know, you know like animals. Humans aren't content with, with working and showing off and bragging and dying because, because real human beings long for God. They search the heavens. They write poetry. They play music. They enjoy the arts. Think the things of God. See, we humans even wonder and worry about whether we will live again after we die. That thought is in us because we have the breath of God in us. See, what John 20 is saying is that now Jesus Christ, the Son of God, took a few disciples, fishermen and tax collectors, and also breathed on them. But not, not life, but the Holy Spirit. He took a deep breath. Jesus took a deep breath and breathed into them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. As quiet as a person's breath, they received the Holy Spirit. And that group, those disciples, helped start this worldwide movement of Christianity. The power of the Holy Spirit in those individuals changed the course of history forever. They became the church, worshiping God, writing scripture, praying, serving others, giving money to the poor, you know, bringing in peanut butter for the food pantry, helping out at Stronghold, making lunch for the homeless shelter, supporting our youth with a, with a silent auction. Who are these people? They are the people on whom God has breathed life into and Christ has breathed the Holy Spirit into. See, my friends, Luke, Luke gives us this really loud, flashy, unforgettable Pentecost and challenges us to celebrate and get all worked up about our faith and be joyful and excited to share the good news of Christ in the world. And that is good, and we need that in the world. Yet John gives us a a softer side of Pentecost, a quiet breath of God upon us to go out quietly and serve others in humility and in kindness. And that is good. And we need that in the world. Two sides of Pentecost. And while they are quite different approaches, we need both in this world. Yet what they have in common, the one thing they have in common is the power of the Holy Spirit descending upon the people. May we go forth with the assurance of that power in our life. 
It's undeniable that that is what is common with Luke and John, is that they both know that with the Holy Spirit, there is incredible power. And that power is ours. You know, sometimes I think maybe that's part of the problem. That's part of our problem in the world, our problem in life. I think that's part of the Church of Jesus Christ problem is that we try to accomplish things without realizing that we have the power of the Holy Spirit on our side. Think about it. Those early Christians, those early Christians, they faced poverty, persecution, and the threat of death almost daily. And yet nothing could stop them. Nothing could stop them from spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. Nothing could stop them from gathering together regularly to praise and to worship God. Nothing could stop them from from serving others and sharing love and grace with them. Nothing could stop them because the power of the Holy Spirit was on their side. It wasn't their own power. It was the Holy Spirit. And we forget that that we need to tap into that power of the Holy Spirit. We need to claim it as our own. You know, someone once drew up a profile of what the, the, we could call it the first church in Jerusalem looked like. You know, the Acts 2 church. See if this sounds like a recipe for success. That first church of Jerusalem was located in the wrong place, and most of the people looked on on the members of that church with scorn and ridicule. They didn't have a building in which to meet. They were limited financially. Most of the members were poor, and the church was constantly on the verge of poverty. The members of the church were not trained for the jobs they were having to do. The membership was small. Acts 2 says about 120 people. The treasurer had just run off with the money, right? Their leader, Peter, had a way of putting his foot in his mouth and was constantly making people mad with him. Two of their leaders, James and John, had no spiritual death, only enthusiasm. There were division among the members, and several members were forced to leave and to move elsewhere. Yet the one thing the church did have was the power of the Holy Spirit, and those disciples believed that, and they changed the world. See, with all of those problems, that church still baptized 3,000 converts after its first revival service. By all rights, the first church in Jerusalem should have failed, and, and they would have if they had been operating under their own power. But God's awesome power, holy power, poured out on his people for the purpose of spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. And, and again, that same power is available to us today. Don't you want the power of the Holy Spirit with you each and every day as you go about your daily tasks, as as great things happen in your life and and when tragedy happens in your life? We want the power of the Holy Spirit with us. We we need to constantly align ourselves with God because we are made in God's image. We need to be in prayer, be in conversation with God, We need to to read Scripture to know what God is saying to us each and every day. We need to gather for worship and worship God and be in community with each other. We need to serve each other and serve the world. Align ourselves with God and, and the power of the Holy Spirit is ours. Are you allowing the power of the Holy Spirit to abide in you, to work through you? Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to transform your life. Let it be our prayer today that the Holy Spirit will move within us, give us life to fill our living so we may go out and like those original disciples in in small and in big ways change the world.